Thank you to Ivy and Soren. And now I have a real pleasure to introduce you to someone named Tristan Harris, who is a dear friend of our conference and someone we as a community have really done everything we can to help his voice rise and to be a microphone for him. And the world is finally listening. It's very exciting. He's been called the closest thing Silicon Valley has to a conscience by The Atlantic magazine and was the former design ethicist at Google. He became a world expert on how technology steers the thoughts, actions, and relationships that structure two billion people's lives, leaving Google to engage public conversation about the issue. He recently started the Center for Humane Technology, a movement intent on reversing the digital attention crisis and realigning technology with humanity's best interests. He's out there fighting for all of us. He's going to be in conversation with Lori Siegel. She is a senior technology correspondent for CNN and editor-at-large for CNN Tech, covering the intersection of technology and culture. Siegel is also the host of CNN's first CNN Go original, Mostly Human, with Lori Siegel a six-part investigative docu-series exploring sex, love, death, humanity through the lens of tech. An award-winning journalist, Siegel specializes in investigative reports showing the impact of technology on our daily lives. Building on her long-standing focus on innovation and entrepreneurship, her work appears across all CNN platforms. She's here with us at Wisdom 2.0 for the first time. Please welcome Lori and Tristan. Hi, guys. Oh, go to the right places. I don't know. If we... <laughs> um, it's so cool to be with you guys. I love the vibe of the audience. I already feel calmer being here. <laughs> um, and it's really cool to be able to sit down with you. We've known each other for so many years, and you've been having we these discussions behind the scenes and for so many years and people are paying attention so yeah, finally uh finally uh finally and and i i can imagine that comes with a lot of responsibility now that people are looking at you as the conscious of silicon valley do you feel that responsibility um well uh there, there is a lot of responsibility i i had the experience earlier this year um, we did a lot of work behind the scenes for the um the november 1st hearings in congress around the russia investigations and, um, you know, the U.S. Congress viewed election manipulation from Russia from a perspective of, you know, what does the super secret classified signal and intelligence sort of cables say about this? And, you know, we found that there weren't that many people in Congress that really understood how social media could be used to manipulate the public. And that realization where you're in the room and you're like, oh my God, like I'm one of the few people that you're looking at to answer these questions. <laughs> and there's a, a set of people, uh, some experts that we brought together to help. And it does feel like there's a huge responsibility now, especially since this is literally shaping world history and geopolitics. It's not just about addiction and distraction, which is what a lot of this gets talked about. It's actually about um, how technology is the most invisible and significant political and cultural actor in the world right now. I mean, just to ground it, there are two billion people, more than two billion people on Facebook. That's more than the number, it's about the number of notional followers of Christianity. Uh, there's 1.5 billion people on YouTube. It's about the number of notional followers of Islam. People check their phones 150 times a day, the millennial sort of audience. And so if you think about it, from the moment you wake up, it's like you're jacked in to this environment, and thoughts start streaming into your head, designed by a few technology companies. So what do you think is at the core of the issue? You've been raising the alarm bells for many years. You've talked about it, you know, addiction to smartphone, the design. Um, if you could kind of boil it down to the core issue, what would it be? Um, it's fundamentally about a misalignment between the incentives that drive where technology is going. People think often that, oh, we could never predict where technology is going. Like, oh, who knows? There's augmented reality and virtual reality and 
phones and new form factors, and it's so exciting, and who knows where it could go. And what we've been trying to say for years is that there's this invisible goal and all the incentives that are driving technology in one very specific direction. And that direction is really important to understand because it helps you predict the future. And that, that invisible goal is this race to capture human attention. Right? There's only so much attention out there in the world, and we've always needed it you know, for TV, for you know, radio, et cetera. But now that technology has this ability to pull on these different subtle levels, levers of the human mind, um, that we're getting better and better and better at manipulating the kind of human social animal. And I, you know, when I was a kid, I was a magician. And so it, it really, that's an important to understand. If you think about magic, right? Magic works on all human minds. It doesn't matter if you have a PhD. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It's a study of the limits and, and instincts of how human minds work. And the idea that there's things that a, a body of people, whether it's magicians or marketers or whatever, can understand about how the mind works, that work no matter what. It's like a, like a banana works on a chimpanzee no matter what, because it just, <laughs> it's built into us. You know, we're running evolutionary hardware. It's millions of years old. And so we have this technology environment, which is evolving in this very specific direction of saying, how can I find out how to capture people's attention? And so it's like evolving and mutating new forms of bananas to pull us into, you know, staying on the screen. Um, and the problem is, as it gets better and better and better at giving us these kind of bananas or sugar or whatever rewards, it's disrespecting the other dimensions of human life. So whether it's, you know, a parent whose attention needs to go to their kids or to their spouse or to the community, um, you know, Facebook or YouTube looks at a parent and it doesn't see a parent, it sees, you know, a vessel of attention that it needs to suck out, right? right? And so it says, what can I do? What can I show this this human being that will perfectly capture their attention. And it's not that it's hurting you, right? But it's, it's the reason when you land on YouTube and you think, I'm just going to watch this one video, and then suddenly you wake up two hours later <laughs> and you're like, what happened? It's because you landed on a supercomputer that's playing chess against, like your mind is a chessboard, and it's playing chess against your mind, and it can see way more steps ahead in the chessboard because it knows way more about your mind than you do, which is a really hard thing to accept. It doesn't mean that we're weak or we're wrong or we're bad. It's just that, you know, if you remember when Gary Kasparov was, was beaten by the AI at chess, once that happened, it doesn't unbeat Gary Kasparov. From that moment onward, in all of human history, the computer can see more steps ahead on the chessboard. It's like it, we're, humans can't play chess against computers anymore. It's done. And then you take AlphaGo and Google, if you know about this, it's like this is a game that was never solved in AI for many, many years. And then suddenly, um, just recently, uh, this new system that Google's built can actually beat the best AlphaGo player in the world. And when you land on YouTube, it's figuring out what are the perfect auto-playing videos I can show next. And the problem is, back to your point, what is the problem? is that the things that work best at capturing attention are not necessarily the things that strengthen the fabric of society. Because as we found out in the last election, conspiracy theories work really good at capturing people's attention. And without anyone at YouTube having that intentional desire, it recommended lots and lots of conspiracy theories to people on YouTube. But ultimately, there's this tension, right? Because these are multi-billion dollar businesses that are built on getting us to pick up our phone and look at our screens and the attention economy, as we call it. So what's the solution? It's not just putting away our phones and you can't really ask tech leaders to build products that we don't want to use. So we've kind of entered this really weird spot where we're all kind of hooked, but we're not really sure what the solution is and, and should the should tech leaders build out products that aren't trying to grab our attention? And how do they do that with these billion-dollar businesses? Well, the elephant in the room is the business model of advertising, right? So long as stock prices are propped up by or directly coupled with how much attention we can suck out of people's brains, as long as that relationship is one-to-one, you can't tell YouTube to not autoplay all those videos. 
You can't tell Snapchat to not put streaks, to put teenagers in this false obligation with each other. You can't tell Facebook not to personalize or filter bubble people into different echo chambers, because these are all things that are the best forms of capturing attention. So the reason we started the Center for Humane Technology, which we just um, announced two weeks ago, uh, you might have seen the article about it, is that the purpose of technology, as it was discussed in the 1980s with you know, Steve Jobs talking about what, what is technology for? The idea of a computer is it's supposed to be a bicycle for our minds. It, it lets you go to new places, have new forms of creativity, you know, new destinations, new frontiers. It's like if you look at the locomotive capacity of a human being without a bicycle, we don't do so well. You give us a bicycle and we can do all these new things. And what's happened with technology is we've just totally drifted away from, this, from empowerment. And so the idea of, of designing technology in a humane way is about first turning the telescope inward at ourselves and understanding how we really work. Like, we're all vulnerable to social validation and social approval. But we've created an environment that is basically giving us hyper-frequent, exaggerated forms of social validation every single moment because these tech designers kind of know how to do that. And so we have to go back and say, if the technology was designed in a humane way, it would protect all of our evolutionary instincts from being abused or exploited and go back to empowerment like a bicycle for our minds. What does that look like? Um, well, uh, so the first thing is we have to be able to restructure the devices and, the, and apps so they're not competing to maximize attention. You know, um, Calm.com or the meditation apps aren't competing to maximize attention. Lyft isn't competing to maximize your attention. If you just imagine drawing this big line in the sand and saying, what are all the things in my life that are trying to maximize how much time it takes? Take everything else on the opposite side of the line, and those are generally tools for empowerment. I love you know, maps and calendar and Lyft and things like that. Um, but the, the phones could be designed, whether it's phones or VR or AR or watches, could be designed in ways where every single feature is about empowerment. And we have to have a conversation about the business model to do that. So what's the, the biggest priority for the Center for Humane uh, Technology? What, you're on the road always. You're kind of behind the doors having all these meetings. So what are, how are we going to see that come into fruition? Is that going to be policy? Is that going to be different actual decisions that Facebook's making to get us less addicted? Yeah, so um, this is really important. So you, I want you all to have hope about how we can get out of this. <laughs> um, it's a little dire right now, right? Give us some hope. Yeah, so... Uh, We'll talk about a bunch of things. There's also a Q&A session later today, and we can go into some of the more details. But, um, so we've identified four major levers that we think a theory of change can be grounded on to fix this problem. So the first is uh, what we call creating a cultural awakening. Right now, most people aren't even aware that there's a problem. Right? I think increasingly that's really changing. I actually do in much part to a lot of the people that are starting to come out, former technology insiders, this Truth About Tech campaign we launched, with Common Sense Media about how this issue affects kids, but really waking up the public that technology is not currently aligned with our best interest, and there are serious costs to that. Um, so 60 Minutes, TED Talks, just much more media, having everybody spread the word, that's like the first thing. You have to do that. Um, second, you'd say, okay, well, gosh, should, should governments get involved? Should we regulate this? Um, Mark Benioff gave a speech at Davos saying we should regulate social media like tobacco companies. Uh, I do think that, that you know, we need to be really careful about getting regulation right, but I do think there's a role for governments, especially in putting pressure on technology companies, because pressure and the threat of regulation have shown to be very effective, even now, at getting companies to change their behavior. But if you think about regulation, that takes, like, years, right? So how is this going to happen faster? The thing we've identified is people in the tech industry... The, the employees, the engineers, the executives, no one wants to harm society. People really do want the best for society. And we think that engaging employees, when, when, when the leadership at, at YouTube finds that they're having trouble attracting and retaining the best people in the world because people feel like this thing is steering kids towards violent videos or it's steering the public and democracy towards conspiracy theories, that pressure point of your own employees um, being frustrated with, with the lack of action is the single most immediate and powerful lever for changing company behavior. Mm -hmm. And by raising public awareness and by people at the companies getting emails from their friends saying, 
um, you know, if you've seen what YouTube's doing, like, why aren't you guys doing something about this? That has an enormous and immediate impact. So that's one of the immediate levers that's very powerful. And then the last thing, what we're doing, the fourth lever, is inspiring alternatives. So we're trying to show there's a different way that all of this stuff could work. Um, humane design is a different field, almost like when IDEO started human-centered design. There's a different way to design home screens, notifications, the core interfaces of applications, so that it doesn't lead to these disastrous outcomes. I just get the sense that this is so personal to mm. you. I mean, before we were all kind of being like, oh no, what is technology doing to our brains? You've just been talking about it forever. Why is this so personal to mm. you? That's a great question. <laughs> um, Um, I think when, when I was at Stanford, <clears throat> I studied at a lab called the Persuasive Technology Lab, um, which taught young engineering students, including my friends who were the founders of Instagram, who were in the same class, by the way, how to identify persuasion in technology. In what ways is your everyday environment influencing the thoughts, attitudes, beliefs, behaviors of your experience? And how could you harness that for good? And this whole class, you know, you studied Edward Bernays and Robert Cialdini and influence and all these fields of like psychological manipulation and all this stuff. You just understand it. Yeah. And then we intersected that with how is technology getting you to do that? Things like LinkedIn having a progress bar saying your profile is 60% complete. Wouldn't you like to be a little bit more complete? And it sounds super <laughs> lame, but it's very effective at getting people to fill out their profile. And th there was this whole discipline of persuasion. But what is persuasion? As persuasion goes up, what is going down? The sovereignty and authority of an agency, the freedom of a mind. If, if the world is better and better and better at hijacking or taking over or persuading us, if that going up, if YouTube's better at persuading us to watch the next video, we're losing something else. And in that class, I remember actually the last class, someone said, um, they proposed basically a future, we were talking about kind of future persuasive technology. And there was a class on, what if you had a profile of what would persuade each individual person, like a personalized ability, like knowing that this human being is more vulnerable to social approval, they respect authority, so they use authority figures. They, you know, just like all the different perfect levers of manipulating this specific mind. And even for political purposes. And it was actually, I don't know how many of you here know Cambridge Analytica or have heard of that, um, but that was a company in the UK that basically does this. And they were used in Brexit and also in the last US elections. I am concerned about this, and the reason I have lost sleep and what makes it personal is having this understanding and a belief that we're not as in control as we think we are, which is a hard thing to accept. It's, it's, yeah. it's kind of a, you're kind of meeting your, the limits of your own perception. It's like, if, I always say, if you beam enlightenment down into an ant, so now an ant opens its eyes and, it, and you, you, it has this knowledge of the universe and it knows how it works and it knows what its brain looks like and it knows all this stuff. The knowledge of that doesn't change the fact that it's still trapped inside of an ant body that's still vulnerable to pheromones, and it's trapped inside of an ant mind that only has so much memory and attention and all these other things. So we're trapped inside of a mind-body system, which I think everybody who's at this conference, all the speakers are experts in. We're hearing from the best people in the world who understand how to operate that system. But persuasion is kind of the adversarial aspect of that. It's about taking over or undermining the authority of, of how we can independently navigate our lives. And so the thing that makes it personal for me is I really see the ways that people are invisibly persuaded, and I see that unless we change course, which we have to do, um, it, it doesn't look good. And so this is why we have to change course. We live in this era where we keep hearing the word unintended, con the words unintended consequences. So do you think at this point it's possible to put the genie back in the bottle? It's possible to to go back and, and rehash this and look at this with, you know, some intent and mindfulness? Um, I think that there's no other choice. So that's the thing that makes me optimistic. There's no one who, when you see where the destination of this road lies, says like, this is great, let's just keep plowing down this road. <laughs> I mean, there's just, um, 
and, and I know we're running out of time, so I just want to say something that um, I've been inspired recently by, um, uh, there's a book called Bury the Chains about the British abolitionist movement, the British abolitionist movement of slavery, and how 12 people, um, not just 12 people, but 12 people started in a printing press. And here was this thing, slavery, that was the, pre the predominant thing propping up the economy, the global economy. Like 75% of the people was in some form of indentured servitude or slavery. And they were able to create pamphlets and parliamentary hearings and witness testimony. And against their own economic interest, they took a hit. So they, when, the, when the British Empire decided to abolish slavery, they had to give up 2% of their GDP every year for 60 years. But they did that. And 12 people creating a printing press, with, starting a lot of the social justice techniques that we now use and adopt, did this for the, on behalf of a, gr a group of people who are outside their tribal in-group. Hmm. For people on a different continent, against their own economic self-interest, and they even worried that, well, if we abolish slavery, but France doesn't, then their economy is going to continue to grow and ours won't. But even those hesitations, they were able to overcome all of that by making it a universal human rights issue. And look at where we are today. I mean, so there is a precedent for the seemingly impossible ability to turn the world upside down, where we all consider something to be totally normal, and then against our own economic self-interest, we can recognize that this is where we have to go. And that's the responsibility of leaders here in Silicon Valley to, to make those decisions. The Zuckerbergs of the world, your friends from Instagram, they have to make those decisions. Yeah, and through the printing press and the public, we're all in like team humanity together mm -hmm. to put the pressure on, on companies to do that. And I, they're going to kill me because we're done. But one last action item, because I know that I have phone addiction. I'm the worst, um, and I struggle with being present. So, like, you're kind of the expert. Give us really, really quick, like, what's a quick action item all of us can do to be more present and to not let the algorithms wrap themselves around our brain? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a couple quick things you can do. Like, the, the amazing thing about this is this literally takes five minutes you can make some super simple changes to your phone, and in five minutes, you can have just a much better experience. It's not like Zuckerberg like, owns your life, right? You can't like, crawl into your brain whatever he wants. <laughs> Very simple. Turn off all of your notifications. Now, that takes five minutes. Like, it's kind of annoying. You have to go to the screen, you have to go like, two layers deep, and you have to like, hit off for each one of these different apps. Like, yeah, it's kind of annoying. Do it, and your, your life will be a lot different. So only keep notifications when for human beings who want your attention as opposed to uh, when machines want your attention. That's the first thing. Um, one thing that I've been pushing recently people find very helpful is uh, turn your phone to grayscale. Um, why do you do that? Because whenever you look at your phone and you see color icons, it's like, it's like you just are activating banana-like things for your brain, right? <laughs> so y y even when you don't have a notification or a red dot, just the color by itself, if you actually, if you meditate, just watch, when you look at your phone, just watch the way that the color kind of activates something. And you won't be able to notice if you just, until you strip off the color. So try Grayscale. There's, these are all on our website, by the way, humanetech.com. There's a page called Take Control. And we have a bunch of different tips. Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot more you can do, but really just if you set your phone to grayscale, turn off notifications, mm -hmm. uh, remove social media apps, use it with the browser, not with the actual native apps, uh, it can make a huge, huge difference for you and your, your family and the people around you. You guys, we got this. We can do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.